Hello, and welcome back to the Gluten Free RN podcast. Today, during episode 62, I'm going to talk about the Irish and celiac disease. Once again, another fascinating topic on a population of people that traditionally probably have been overlooked for celiac disease. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to the Gluten-Free RN podcast. I'm Nadine Gruskowiak, the Gluten-Free RN. Today during episode 62, I am going to give you a lot of information on the Irish and celiac disease. Keeping in mind that there was a huge emigration from Ireland to different parts of the world. So people of Irish descent are all over the world which is another good reason to keep in mind that people of Irish descent are at high risk, some would say, for developing celiac disease. And this is really important for people of Irish descent to keep in mind that they really are at risk for developing celiac disease for a number of reasons. And if they have symptoms that are really kind of wacky, they need to be tested for celiac disease or things like IBD, osteoporosis, anemia, failure to thrive, failure to grow, which means stunted growth. People might be short, red hair, hazel eyes, red hair, blue eyes, red hair, period. People with red hair tend to really be gene carriers of the HLA DQ2 and or DQ8. Not quite sure what that's all about. We need to look at that a little bit closer genetically. But of course, not having red hair doesn't rule you out from celiac disease. So really, everyone, regardless of your heritage, need to be tested for celiac disease. But today, we're going to specifically focus on many of my friends and (laughs) people I love and adore, the Irish. I grew up in South Buffalo, where there is a high population of Irish people. So many friends... Shout out to Lenore and Beth and all my Irish friends from South Buffalo. Robin, I went to a Catholic all-girls school, so there's a lot of people of, like I said, Irish descent right there in South Buffalo that are very, very good friends of mine. So this particular population, I hold dear and near to my heart, and I would love it if they would look at their medical history and their family medical history, and consider the fact that they very might well have celiac disease that's been undiagnosed. It's another population where celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity have typically not been tested or tested for correctly. Did you know that Irish setters, which by the way have red hair, are one of the only dogs that have been determined to have celiac disease and actually do much better on a gluten-free diet (laughs) or a paleo-type diet, which I have highly recommended that all dogs and cats be on some variation of a paleo diet. Basically, we're omnivores, which means we eat plants and primarily animals or meat. So once Irish shutters are placed on a gluten-free diet, their villus atrophy, hmm, does that sound familiar, goes away and their health issues tend to go away. So it is very important that we keep celiac disease and non-celiac disease gluten sensitivity very high on our list of things to test for, not just for humans, but for our pets too. So just a little bit of history before we get too started into celiac disease in the Irish population. For the vast majority of time, the island of Ireland was a potato-based diet, and those people grew potatoes, and they even made bread. They made potato bread. They typically did not have access to many grains. And so when there was a potato famine or a potato blight, that focused primarily in the time period of 1845 and lasted for six years, so 1845 to 1849, it caused the death of at least a million people from starvation and related disease. 
that potato famine also caused people to migrate to the United States, Australia, and many other parts of the world. Those people took their genes with them. And if they happen to be carriers of the HLA DQ2 and or DQ8 gene, then they are very much at risk for developing celiac disease proper. I've heard a few people say, well, celiac disease is really common in Europe, but not here in the United States. And I would always recommend that people really use their critical thinking skills and say, you know what, those genes don't go away just by crossing an ocean. We bring those genes with us and that genetic makeup. And roughly 30 to 50% of the population carries the HLA DQ2 and or DQ8 gene. So we really do need to have a high index of suspicion for developing celiac disease at any age, any ethnicity with symptoms or without symptoms. And whether they are a man or a woman or male or female, it doesn't really matter. The studies tend to suggest that women are much more likely to develop celiac disease, but the statistics don't actually bear that to be true, especially in the pediatric population where it's one to one. It is really best just to keep a high index of suspicion for just about anyone that shows up with symptoms that don't really make sense or compounding symptoms or diagnoses that, you know, really people should not be as sick as they are. I found a really nice document from the Quality and Practice Committee, and it's called The Diagnosis and Management of Adult Celiac Disease. The authors are Dr. Audrey Russell, Dr. Amon Shanahan, and Professor Amon Quigley. This really is a nice document. I've included really quite a ton of references for this Gluten Free RN podcast, episode 62, in the podcast notes. There is a wealth of information on the web, of course, anyway, but even just a Google search of the Irish and celiac disease resulted in 441,000 hits. So there's a lot of information. Just go through it. I, Like I said, did include a fair amount of data and reference articles, but you find your own. You do your own research. It's really important to know that when you are doing research, please spell celiac, C-O-E-L-I-A-C, along with the more common C-E-L-I-A-C you will find different articles and different information. It is spelled celiac, C-O-E-L-I-A-C, in about half of the research articles. I love the clinical presentation and complications that are listed in this particular article and document. It's in Table 1, and the gastrointestinal symptoms due to malabsorption include diarrhea, steatorrhea, abdominal cramps, abdominal bloating and distension, borborygmy, which of course is that rumbling that people get, that people can hear that rumbling in the intestines from across the room if someone has it. I call it roiling in the ear intestines. It just feels oh, like they're twisting and very much not okay, but it also causes a noise. That's that borborygmy. So a new word for some of you, perhaps, excessive flatulence. And of course, that's farting. If somebody you know or love has a lot of gas, especially if it's really stinky, those would be the people that need to get tested for celiac disease. Weight loss, but patients may also be overweight or obese. Gastrointestinal symptoms due to dysmotility could include heartburn, regurgitation, dysphagia or difficulty swallowing vomiting, epigastric pain, and constipation. So here we have those dual diagnoses of diarrhea and or constipation. Hematologically, you could have an iron B12 or folate deficiency, thrombocytopenia, especially if it's idiopathic thrombocytopenia, thrombocytosis, thromboembolism, leukopenia or neutropenia, vitamin K malabsorption leading to coagulopathy or any bleeding dyscrasia, hyposplenism, 
And of course, we did a whole episode of the Gluten-Free RN podcast on the spleen. You can listen back to that. IgA deficiency is very common in people with celiac disease and lymphoma. The liver enzymes could be abnormal, especially the AST and ALT. Those are liver enzymes. The skin, of course, dermatitis herpetiformis, which if you have dermatitis herpetiformis, you have celiac disease, alopecia or hair loss. In the oral cavity, we have aphthous mouth ulcers, also known as canker sores, glossodynia or red tongue or inflamed tongue, defective tooth enamel, rheumatological would be arthralgia or joint pain, For bones, osteopenia, osteoporosis, osteomalacia, osteomalacia being soft bones, and typically a deficiency of vitamin D along with calcium and magnesium. So if we don't correct that, especially in a toddler or an infant, then they very well will develop rickets, which is a bowing of the legs. So it's very important to make sure that we find people early or before a woman gets pregnant whether they're Irish or not, so we can prevent a lot of these things from happening. Gynecologically, late monarch, and that means women are getting their periods later in their teens. I just saw a woman who, again, I just saw a woman in my office who did not get her period until she was 16 years old. That's very concerning. But nobody tested her for celiac disease. Early menopause, infertility, and recurrent miscarriage. Now, this same woman that didn't get her period until she was 16 had about 15 pregnancies, but 13 of them ended in miscarriage or stillbirth. Neurological issues such as ataxia or difficulty walking straight, being clumsy, partial seizures or full seizures, tonic-clonic seizures, any seizure disorder, migraine headaches, peripheral neuropathy, depression, chronic fatigue, And the real reason I read this entire list is Muzzy Head, and that's M-U-Z-Z-Y Head. (laughs) So I had to get that in there. I think some of us would say brain fog or difficulty focusing, having a hard time thinking or reading or retaining information. But here it's actually under psychological Muzzy Head. I really like that. You'll probably hear me say that in the future. But the complications of celiac disease in Table 2, and the reason we really do want to find all of these people with celiac disease early, is because the complications of celiac disease are osteopenia or osteoporosis, malignancies such as oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, and that's in your mouth or in your throat, cancer, enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma, adenocarcinoma of the jejunum, or any part of the bowel, iron deficiency anemia, splenic atrophy, which means your spleen actually shrinks, infertility, recurrent miscarriage or stillbirths, any ulcerative bowel issues, neurological disorders, and of course, dermatitis herpetiformis, That external expression of whatever's going on internally, typically celiac disease, on your skin. So it's very painful, very itchy, and there's a direct correlation with dermatitis herpetiformis with celiac disease. If you have celiac disease, it doesn't mean you're going to get dermatitis herpetiformis. But if you do have dermatitis herpetiformis, you have celiac disease. So first degree relatives need to be tested for celiac disease because it is genetic, whether they have symptoms or not. And this is mandatory. Unfortunately, I run into a lot of people who have had a sibling or family member that was diagnosed with celiac disease, but the rest of the family does not get tested. It's very frustrating because we know that those people are at super high risk for developing celiac disease. If they don't already have it, there's a good chance they could develop it, especially if they're an HLA DQ2 and or DQ8 gene carrier. Table 3 notes that there are conditions associated with an increased prevalence of celiac disease type 1 diabetes, autoimmune thyroid disease, metabolic bone disease, or early osteoporosis. And do look for osteoporosis even in children. Unfortunately, we're finding a lot of liver disease, osteoporosis, 
autoimmune diseases in children. And if it's preventable and we're not preventing it, that's a problem. Irritable bowel disease. Of course, you all know that when I hear irritable bowel disease, I do always want to know what, in fact, is irritating those bowels. What is causing that irritable bowel syndrome or disease? Primary biliary cirrhosis, autoimmune hepatitis, Sjogren's syndrome, Addison's disease, Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, Williams syndrome, selective IgA deficiency, and abnormal liver enzymes. So go back and read that great document. Again, it's called Diagnosis and Management of Adult Celiac Disease. And it really is a darn good research and evidence-based information that you can find right on the podcast notes. Just pull it up. Again, it's Diagnosis and Management of Adult Celiac Disease. Really good information and worth a look. But again, there's a myriad of information that I have put on the podcast notes, so please take a look at it. And it is estimated that celiac disease in Ireland at this point is at least one in a hundred, which matches what is reported as the prevalence of celiac disease in the rest of the world, except for a few populations. But I would suggest that perhaps the Irish people have not been tested appropriately. And they, along with many other ethnic groups, have been underreported and undertested, of course, grossly underdiagnosed. And we really do need to get on this because it affects not just this generation of people, not just the next one, but future generations and whether actually people can have children. So there's a number of reasons to make sure that people are tested appropriately. And what does testing people appropriately mean? That they actually get a serum blood test for the total IgA, total IgG, anti-tissue transglutaminase IgA, anti-tissue glutaminase, anti-tissue transglutaminase IgG, the DGP, which is the deaminated gliadin peptide, I always like to include an AGA, an anti-gliadin antibody, because it picks up people for, if not celiac disease proper, then definitely for non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And those people really do need to be found early. Some of the people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity are much sicker than my people that actually meet the criteria for celiac disease proper, and they get better just by adopting a gluten-free diet or a paleo-type diet. My intention is to do an entire podcast on the fact that probably John F. Kennedy likely had celiac disease. I did include an article about that on this particular podcast, keeping in mind that the Kennedy family is most assuredly Irish and Catholic. So another topic for the Gluten-Free RN podcast will be celiac disease and Catholics, because once a week, if not more, people are given communion, which includes a wheat wafer, symbolic of the body of Christ. So we will go over that and make sure that people understand the problems that could occur if you have celiac disease and are consuming those wheat wafers at church. Like I said, it is very likely that John F. Kennedy did have celiac disease, and I highly encourage if you're a Kennedy, related to the Kennedy family, that you, in fact, are tested for celiac disease because their medical history really is suggestive of celiac disease. Another reason I'm very interested in Ireland is, number one, I'm going to plan another trip to Ireland. I do, in fact, love Ireland. I did the Dublin Marathon in 1998, (laughs) way before I was diagnosed with celiac disease, did, in fact, finish that marathon. Took me about six hours. So mine is an endurance marathon rather than a, I'm going to be the fastest Polish woman in Ireland to win a race. It's never going to happen. But I do finish. That was my first marathon. I determined that if I could go to Ireland and the only way to do it was to run a marathon, then by gosh, I was going to do it. And like I said, that was way before I knew I had celiac disease. So we did go to the Guinness Beer Factory and I sampled the Guinness beer. Now, you would think at that point that I would be super healthy and 
my body would be, you know, really, I was much younger, of course, that was 1998. That was 20 years ago. Oh my gosh. So 20 years ago, I did my first marathon. And by the time I came home and was flying in the airplane, I got off the plane and I had the worst edema I had ever had in my lower extremities. I could barely tie my shoes and it was, I think my feet were leaking. So I ended up with wet shoes because I had so much edema in my legs. And at that point, I was... I was about 32 years old. Not what I would have expected, but perhaps a early indicator that I did in fact have celiac disease, but I didn't pick it up and no one else picked it up until I was 40. There are many indicators. So please keep in mind that this happened to me. I'm a nurse. I didn't know what to look for. And I'm really trying to make sure that you have the information that you need to protect yourself and your family the information you need so that you can successfully get healthier, successfully get tested for celiac disease, and keeping in mind that you can't be ruled out, especially if you're an HLA DQ2 and or DQ8 gene carrier. You can be ruled in for celiac disease, but at this time in history, you cannot effectively be ruled out for celiac disease. So you need to be tested at least every year, Or if you develop celiac disease symptoms, which mm, there's over 300 of them, it's a good idea to get tested right away. There's something on the internet I ran across today that said you can't prevent celiac disease, and I disagree with that. You can prevent celiac disease, even if you are an HLA DQ2 and or DQ8 gene carrier, by strictly avoiding all of the gluten grains, which are wheat, barley, rye, and for some of us, oats also especially if they're contaminated with those gluten grains or grown in the same field. Ireland does have a celiac society. So if you do live in Ireland, there is a celiac society. Again, it's C-O-E-L-I-A-C with lots of great information and support for people with celiac disease. Keeping in mind that there are health ramifications if you are not diagnosed with celiac disease early. So it really is important to make sure that your family is protected by testing for celiac disease every year. Even in Ireland, it's estimated that the rate of diagnosis is increasing. Celiac disease remains undiagnosed in most affected individuals. And the average duration of symptoms prior to diagnosis was nine months, but ranged from two to 48 months. So that's four years. So one to four years. It would be much shorter in Ireland. (laughs) It was still a long time to get a diagnosis of celiac disease. In the United States, it's on average of nine to 15 years. So if you're Irish and you live in the United States, it might take on average of nine to 15 years to get diagnosed with celiac disease. But really, if we're working at this, hopefully we can get people diagnosed much quicker, ideally, so that they do not have to suffer. So if you want more information about celiac disease in general, please consider reading my book, Donation, a nurse's memoir of celiac disease from missed diagnosis to food and health activism. You could also consider traveling with me, Nadine Griskoyak, the gluten-free RN. This summer, July 2018, I am taking a nice-sized group of very fun people on the Danube on a river cruise. If you'd like to join us, look for that information on my website, The Gluten Free RN, or look for that information on the podcast notes. And if you can't join us in July 2018 for the Danube cruise, please look back or make recommendations or request a trip. And if I can, I'll put a nice trip together so that we can all get to know each other. I'm available also for speaking engagements whether it's to the Celiac Society of Ireland or a hospital or any type of facility that needs to be educated about celiac disease, which at this point can be anywhere worldwide. But if there is a group in Ireland that would like me to come speak, just get a hold of me. Well, this is a shout out to all my Irish friends and Irish people all over the world. My hope for you is that you understand that celiac disease can affect you, your family, and your friends. 
Celiac disease is a worldwide phenomenon. If you are a gene carrier for HLA, DQ2, and or DQ8, then you are at risk for developing celiac disease proper. And if you do not carry those genes, you are still at risk for non-celiac gluten sensitivity. This has been another episode of the Gluten-Free RN podcast, episode 62 to be exact, on the Irish and celiac disease. Thank you very much for joining me, Nadine Griskoyak, the Gluten-Free RN. And while I may have red hair and hazel eyes, I in fact am Polish. But thanks to my friends from South Buffalo, I very much felt like an Irish person when I attended Mount Mercy Academy in South Buffalo. So thanks for joining me once again, episode 62 of the Gluten-Free RN podcast. Until the next episode, please consider getting tested for celiac disease proper and non-celiac gluten sensitivity, especially if you're Irish, or recommend anyone of Irish descent get tested for celiac disease It's very important that we prevent any of the medical sequelae that so commonly goes along with celiac disease. If you're in Ireland, there's a good chance I'm going to come see you in the next year or two. And I can't wait. Once again, this is Nadine Groskowiak, the Gluten-Free RN, signing out from episode 62. Bye for now. Bye for now.